thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll mainly be showing pictures. Um, so, like we've like seen a lot of simulations and um, and so on of like beam patterns, but um, I've done some work on um, actually measuring the beam patterns, and I just want to show them and maybe point out like interesting features that I see. Um, so the aim of the project is to develop like functionality for um, CAT7 to like just measure the, like the beam patterns over the like observing frequencies. Like normally with photography, it's not um, performed at the actual frequencies at which you like observing, and um, like you can hopefully use these patterns usefully during imaging um, after they've been parameterized usefully. Um, yeah, and like hopefully. Um, like this work might be good enough to do um, commissioning and um, you know like testing like this dish surface like and I mean hopefully it's like good enough that you don't need to like to expand photography but you know we'll have to see about that still. Um, so the measurement procedure um, the way it's set up is that you can specify like a, a set of like scanning antennas and tracking antennas independently and um, you can kind of choose an experiment what you want to do. So you could either have like many tracking antennas and one scanning antenna to boost the signal to noise ratio or you can um, choose like another like setup. Um, like then after you've done the observation you flag the data and or choose like what subset of the data you wanted to do have to, um, to investigate. So that allows you to for example um, do you look at elevation dependent effects or so on um, using like a single data set? Um, what you first do is like on axis calibration, um, and then after that, like you apply this on axis calibration to the off axis data, and then um, I can calculate immediately or directly from the visibility data, um, like the beam pattern, like one sample per visibility point. And then that's just um, interpolated onto a grid. So the first type of scans that um, I've made was like radial scans, which like this red line um, shows kind of like how um, like a scan would go. Um, yeah, so it's like kind of so it's supposed to go like in a pattern like up here, but then um, I've noticed that there's actually a problem with the projection um, or like the target plane, the way it's defined, is not actually the same as the feed plane, which is like the plane that you actually really want to measure. And um, that is the effect that on a different like elevations and azimuth offsets, you end up like observing actually a pattern that looks like the ones at the bottom. Um, and so if you know like your projections correctly, then it doesn't really matter how you scan, um, then you can figure it out. Um, like, you know, after you've done the measurements, um, you know, like where to actually place your points on your final map grid. Um, so like this just shows, like, flagging. Um, these patterns that you see here are, so this is like elevation in that direction and time in this direction. So this is like one scanning cycle and then another scanning cycle and then so on. It's like quite a long observation. Um, and then, well, like your spectrum like that, you can also flag. Um, this kind of this allows you to, for example, <coughs> like you know, flag out or um, just select like a particular set of elevations that you're interested in, for example. Um, now to show you this distortion that I've alluded to before, um, on the left you can see this distortion happening on that side, and on this side it's um, corrected. Um, yeah, and that, just another effect that I've um, resolved. Uh, so like this is just to show how to like if you do like your gain normalization, um, like basically per sample, not per sample, but like um, like very often, then you can create like you know um, like other reports that you might see. Like if you do um, multiple scan cycles. And um, so like another improvement that I've done was to do like spiral scans instead of like instead of radial scans. And um and well it just um 
samples the outer side of the beam a little bit better. Um, and there's another aspect about this. So on the left, you've got the radial scan cycles again, and on the right, you've got like the um, spiral scans. And then you can see that if your source has just um, you know started arising, then um, like by doing the scans in that way, you actually kind of guarantee that you you won't like have um, your antenna pointing below the like horizon or like what your horizon limit are uh, like is and um, like by doing it that way. Whereas like with the radial scans, we scan all the way through from the one extent to the other extent, and um, then you, you could actually end up in a situation where you scan like below the horizon. Um, if you, you know. uh, okay, so then this just shows. Yeah, the problem is also with this projector; you can't really see the um, or appreciate the detail as much. But um, like this just shows like the radial scan versus a spiral scan using the same amount of observation time. Um, so like that's like yeah, 100 minutes to, to acquire this pattern, and it's over 24 degrees. Is it just me, or is the, this one a bit squashed in the vertical direction? Uh, well, this is for one feed. Um, it's, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, on the left, you know, the center is sort of quite circular, but on the right, you know, the, the response is you know, squashed in the vertical direction. Um, I'm not sure if that's like maybe just a projector effect. Um, like you should actually like look at the picture um, while like an onward monitor, and then maybe. But I, or which part of the beam okay. are you talking about? Just the innermost, the innermost response. Yeah. The main beam. Oh, okay. On the left, it looks circular, and on the right, it looks like an ellipsoid. I don't know. Like on this screen, it looks. It's interesting more to similar. plot the difference between the two, actually. Yeah. No, I, I think that that's like a fit somehow on, on the monitor. Yeah. Ach, I mean, on the yeah, every no, projector. Like it yeah. does appear here to be like more similar. Yeah. Um. OK, so just to show like a full pattern. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, so the, the, this is for the X feed and the, and the well, the, the current cross correlation um, patterns for the X and the Y feed, and then also the, the phase as well. Um, and like aperture plane, it looks like that. Um, so now, so in, on the scale, yeah, that's supposed to be millimeters. So, like, I don't know if the areas are really like 20 millimeters large. Um, but anyway, like, I'll have to still compare it with like X band results and like see. Yeah. Okay. And then the frequency response. Um, so, yeah, like what I try to show in this pack, uh, well, in this slide, I've got three of them as well. It's, it's a bit difficult to show, but if you look carefully, it's, you can see that there's a, 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 a the pattern kind of repeats like on a um, like every uh, what is it like 32 megahertz. Um, like you can see it actually based here. Um, so like this pattern here looks like looks quite similar to this one, but this one looks similar to that one. So you can see that there's like a cyclical pattern. That like repeats and this, the frequency steps here in between these samples are 16 megahertz. So there's like some sort of like oscillation in the pattern. What are those points in the middle? Yeah, like I, this is uh, some RFI points in this in this one. I should actually maybe like only show you like these ones. <laughs> but um, so like this is now like a whole range of like frequencies starting at 18.32 megahertz and then like down there and then down even more. So there's like this one, th this one has like some frequent, well, there's some RFI that I didn't flag out, so it's still visible in this one. And then there's actually here as well. Um, okay. So what I've noticed was um, there's some asymmetries if you look closely at the, at the beam center um, in the, pr the primary beam area, especially for the, um, for the, like the cross polarization patterns, and um, they're different for different antennas. And um, I'm not quite sure like what causes it. And uh, I'd like 
to actually know from people that knows like about telegraphy and so on. Like maybe they've got some ideas of like why um, why that happens. So like these features, so you can see it's like symmetrical, fairly symmetrical in this case, but like there, that thumb there is like is larger. And for other antennas, like so this is antenna five and this one is antenna four, but you can see that the patterns, like the asymmetries are different. Um, like, uh, yeah, I've also done this using different sources and also different, um, you know, center frequencies, and the uh, like the results remain like similar. You know, so you, what I mean is that you you see these features in the beam pattern at that frequency, regardless of the target that you use and regardless of the, um, you know, like of the well center frequency that you use. But obviously, by that I mean you, your bandwidth is. Quite large, it like overlaps. Which um, means that you can. Hmm? Is this the Jones matrix again? The yeah, this is the Jones matrix. So the XX looks definitely squashed squ squ compared to the. So this the is y the XX, and that's the other YY. Yeah, so it is. It is. It does look a bit different. This is not. Um, this is. Well, I mean, I sh can show you like a whole lot more of these, but. Um, Do you understand why it's squashed? Uh, I think that like. Like you know, I think that you sh like I think that this picture here appears okay on my monitor. Like yeah, like this is as, like looks more similar to this one. You know, so it's not like as squashed as it is here, but and um, there is a a squashed a squashing effect between those two. Yeah, and um, like the central part is not really squashed, but like if you look at the outer part of the main lobe, it is it appears to be squashed. So it's like not the central area, so like where it's red, it's not, it's it's actually round. And like where it's like yellow, it starts becoming more um, more squashed in like the various directions. And I, I don't but it's know. it's the same dish. Uh, well, so like this this set here is like a Jones matrix for antenna 4, and that is oh. Jones matrix for antenna 5. So this is the X feed, and that's the Y feed. Um, so like I think Oleg was saying that mm -hmm. this appears to be squashed. Yeah. And that appears to be squashed in a different way. It's like it's the red part is actually must circular. Be in the receiver, no? Sorry, it must be in the receiver. And um, well, I assume that well, these patterns are direction dependent effects, which is a combination of the receiver and the dish. So, is, is it possible to rotate? The trick is to rotate the receiver by 90 degrees. That's uh, physically. Yeah. Well, as I well, one can probably look at that, but um, I think that. Um, you know, like this is a combination of the, of yeah. this of the dish as well as the receiver, and so if the one, you know, like that might give you some more insights, but it doesn't mean it's going to do what you think it will necessarily. But yeah, just lots of separate. Yeah, it's a good idea, but um, I don't know about the manpower involved. <laughs> you know, like the thing is, like part of the thing is that we want to not. To X band allography and hopefully get by just using L band allography, um, you know, like for t testing dish surface accuracy. But you know, I don't know if that's actually like a really feasible idea, because like maybe you can't get the resolution that you want. Um, yeah. But anyway, like we still want to test and see what how good it gets. Um, well, you certainly can't measure the smaller than a wavelength. Yeah, and and clearly that's what you want for the higher frequencies. So it's yeah, kind of hard to. Imagine how that. Well, I mean, then you'd have a, you know, like if you're observing at like the frequency that you're observing at, then surely the dish accuracy at that wavelength is the only thing that's really important. But um, so if you have like a, a better feed, then you can observe it that that you know, if you like installed like a higher frequency feed into your system, then you know you can then do your logography at that frequency. Um, but I think at the moment, well. You don't get the information on where the errors are at less than wavelength. You get right. a total you know, overall magnitude of the errors from the. Uh, you can make a projection. It would have the nearly the same sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah. As the um, yeah. Uh, okay, so like another thing is that I looked here at like a. Uh, so I've been using various sources, and this one is Taurus A. Which is actually resolved for this particular base. Well, antenna seven is a far out antenna, so the other antennas actually work fine, which I don't like really show. But like the antenna seven for um, Taurus A, it being like so resolved, causes like quite a bit of problems as you can see there. So like the on-axis calibration didn't actually work that well, 
and then you end up with results like that. But then if you do baseline flagging based on like a baseline length, then you actually fix that. Then, um, but yeah, the the um, yeah, like so the the scans that correspond to these elements there then also went um, like was then flagged as well. So you end up with like a nice well a better pattern. Like Taurus A is obviously quite useful because it's very bright, so you can get good signal to noise ratio. Um, okay, so now probably like thing that people are most interested in is like how does it compare with simulated results? Um, and you know you can should maybe like tell me like how good it compares. Um, so like you know it seems as if there's like these features which are so if you look at like Okay, so the first problem is that the frequencies don't really correspond um, to the data that they have at the moment. Um, like we can't, like our system can't actually measure at like two gigahertz because um, like of filters. What's and the bottom plot, Matthew? The, uh, so the bottom plots are the um, the simulated results from EMSS, yeah. and the top ones are like the L band yeah. measurements, uh, the measured results, and these are all Jones matrix. So, so they are like plotted the, to the same, so rendered all, to the same scale here. They approximately, like the color scales are the same for all of them, and the the extents are the same. But the plots obviously don't like match up like very nicely to each other. Um. So you know. So what you can see is that you know, like in my view, like there are quite a, a lot of differences in what you see between the. So like this, this is like you know, it's sixteen. Well, approximately 1.6 gigahertz and 6, 1.6 gigahertz and 2 gigahertz and 1.8 gigahertz. Um, so these two are supposed to match up, and like these two are supposed to match up. But then, as you can see, they don't like match up necessarily very well. But there's features that look similar. So, for example, you can see there's these two stripes there to go up there, which is you know here and here, and there's like a big area here on that side and that side that's like zero almost, and like there's that area there and that area there. And you know, like things like things like those features you can like see are similar, but if you look at, you know, other things like nearby, like that like yellow bit there, for example, it doesn't like quite match up with what you do is averaged over eight megahertz, is that right? Um this is average over eight mega uh, sixteen megahertz actually. Yeah. And um, and the simulation no, that is yeah that's on the frequency itself. But I, huge, I'm, yeah. what's the difference between the right um, and the left? All different frequencies. Sorry, the right and the left. Yeah, like it's the different frequencies. So that's on the right. It's mainly like around two gigahertz, and on the left it's like around one point six gigahertz. What's very interesting, if you if you remember the beam patterns that I showed that Natian showed, which yeah. we got from the MSS patterns, they actually look qualitatively they look a lot more like. Your okay. measured patterns, but then what's wrong with these? Yeah, than, than the ones you have below. So maybe it's some kind of a yeah. in the tool chain that you used to produce the bottom plots from the simulations. Maybe okay. there's some kind of a problem maybe there. Maybe they didn't put in the antenna, or if it's only the feed, or I don't know. But, but the bottom plots look a lot less yeah. like our plots. Okay. Yeah, so I also noticed that, but I wasn't. Yeah, the thing is that also, as I said, like these cycles as well. You know, like the 32 mega cycles and. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate, yeah, there's some sort of, um, you know, cyclical pattern, well, but so I, I that's agree. That's the basic standing wave frequency coming from the primary yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. The reflector and, and the feed. Yeah. And that's what the, and yeah. I, mean, now, I, I certainly can, you know, like, it's it's like just the option, you know, to like use it uh, to change the channelization, you know, like I can use like, you know, whatever it can with the, you know, like you do. You obviously get a little bit more noisy results, but I found that substantially, you, like the, the images look more or less the same. You know, like if you if you do it, if you average it overall, you know, effectively use like a, a 16 mega uh, megahertz bandwidth. You know, like if you use a 16 megahertz bandwidth, it's, the result is going to actually look substantially the same as if you use like a 4 megahertz bandwidth. I mean, but I should maybe like you know do it actually side by side that you can actually see. Um, but yeah, I I, I I think the point is that there's intrinsic frequency structure at sort of one or two megahertz uh, resolution. Yeah, and that's the intrinsic scale you need to match if you want to see the pattern. And yeah. as soon as you start averaging over more bandwidth, well, then you yeah. start to average that out. Yeah. And if the simulation was only done at, at a spot frequency, then 
clearly yeah. it won't yeah, match I mean, any kind of averaged version. Yeah. Now, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, as Oleg says, that there's like another um, issue which, like, it seems if he has, like, different patterns, simulated EMSS patterns, and I do for some other reason. You start with the same patterns, but you just have completely different independent tools to go from the EMSS data to, to the figures below. And my figures look substantially more similar to the measurements than his figures, so I think what yeah. we should do is yeah, actually let's do, yeah. just do a cross check with my tools. Too. Yeah, that okay. just gives you an independent, yeah. independent tool to use. Okay. Um. Yeah. I, I. I have. I mean, I hear what you say about um frequency averaging, but I have actually looked at that and I just found that you know I do you know if you do like a 50 megahertz average, then you get like you know then it kind of totally messes up your results. But like with um 32. After with 16 megahertz averaging, it's um, you know like it's you get similar results if you do it like four megahertz. Um, you know, but it just depends where in the pattern you're sampling it to whether it's going to be similar or yeah. very different. Yeah. But if there's this periodic modulation, yeah. then yeah. No, I, I agree with yeah. what you say. But I mean, um, have, have you seen the paper that um, Attila Popping and I published in 2007, 2008? Where we do uh, the same thing for the Westerbork telescope, the frequency results holography. Uh, because I all the effects that you're describing, yeah. okay. we, we saw there as well, okay. including the okay. appropriate periodicity for that combination, okay. which is 17 megahertz yeah. instead of your 32. Okay. But, uh, Did you also see um, this sort of effects that I'm talking about here, like the ones that you see, like these asymmetries in the cross pole patterns? We didn't. But that's also not, like not the in detail, but certainly cost. that there, there's a very pronounced ellipticity to the x's and the y's that is perpendicular to each other. Yes, and and that it changes significantly through that modulation pattern as well. Okay. Um, so yeah. Okay. Now that's encouraging. Well, I mean, if you look at the, if you transform these into amplitude and phase, the amplitude is the amplitude centered on the center of the dish. Um, okay, the the aperture. The, um, the amplitude of the, on the you know, on the aperture plane is the amplitude centered on the center of the dish. Yes, it is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because so that could explain the asymmetry. If you feed this pointing slightly across the center of the dish, yeah, it will give you a, a, an asymmetric. Across the yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now I I believe um you know like I I I do think that it's got something to do with like either that the Antenna, you know, you could say that maybe the antenna feed is like slightly pointing in a different direction than you thought. But the the, the issue is though that that this, these asymmetries, and I didn't really show it here, they actually change with frequency. So um, so it, it appears then as if it's like maybe pointing slightly different in one at one frequency, and then like at another frequency, it's like points slightly different in another direction. So that kind of like implies that your feed has like some strange like electromagnetic. Properties that changes with frequency, and you know, I don't know if that's like a true thing. You know, like, or that's why I kind of want to know from you people if that's you know what's uh, what's actually going on. Um, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, is it possible for a for a feed to be at one frequency be more sensitive to one direction and at another frequency be more sensitive to another direction? Is that like possible? Because that appears to be like you know what I see. <laughs> More possible and most occurring probably because on a prime focus you just have the this kind of beating. Yeah. On a most Gregorian you have this kind yeah. of beating. Yeah, I must say that you know, like, so if you look at like these frequencies, that it starts at like yeah, sixteen uh, mega, sixteen hundred megahertz. About like these patterns are quite um, symmetrical actually, and it's for like a very long range. And it's only like as you get to like the higher end of it, of it that you start seeing like these asymmetries. Which is like, um, yeah, well, interesting. Okay, so um, yeah, well, that's almost all that I wanted to show. I mean, um, so I get like good beam patterns using well, Orion A or so, so and Virgo A, and like they all like give similar results. Um, but the brighter they are, the less you have to observe them to get like similar signal to noise ratios, um, and like the Features in the antenna, the difference, well, in the beam bags, the difference per antenna, and um, yeah, like they seem to be like persistent. Yeah, okay. Any more?
questions? Yeah. So, like, I can maybe call two or two more people. Well, it depends what the goal is. I mean, but certainly with respect to setting surfaces or adjusting them, people try to do it at the highest possible frequency where they still have enough uh, signal to noise. Uh, because that's where you have the greatest sensitivity to these well, adjustment errors. But um, exactly. I mean, well, once you've set it, then you just want to know it. You want to measure it as, as well as you can at every frequency and do a frequency resolved and everything else. And then you want to use the information in the calibration. Okay. There's no alternative. Once you've got the combination the way it's going to be, you just want well, to document it. Understanding it, but for setting the panels yep. to get the right shape and the highest frequency yeah. 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 is the best. Alma does 90 units, what would be it's used up to 900 units. You've got no choice, you've got no choice. And that's, that's pretty much it's made that. So you can look at it. It just you know, it does scale up. It's just you have to think a little bit. Okay, Bill, you're, you're also. Oh, I was going to ask if you looked at the um, the beam asymmetries and the the aperture domain. Well, that must be where the problem is coming from. And it should be more obvious. What's okay. happening? Okay. You mean in the like specifically for the crossbow? Aperture plane images. Yeah, the ones that you didn't understand. If yeah. you looked at the Fourier transform. Yeah, I, I have um, seen, I mean, I have lived there, but I kind of don't have an intuitive feel for what goes on there. You know, like, uh, you know, if you if you look at this, like, you know, what does this mean to you? You know, like, this, this, this means, like, well, that's like kind of your dish, dish surface. Accuracy measurement diameter differ from a parabola or something, and this is like your like this full out well, um, you know, your illumination pattern effectively. But like what you know, like you can see these asymmetries here. Oh, oh actually, um, now I guess, yeah, I guess like this, the one that I used for this was actually probably quite quite symmetrical. I guess the so. I should, that's the, yeah, the, the, the on the, 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 the left hand yeah. side it's the magnitude, <coughs> and on the right hand side it's the phase. Yeah. I mean, I think you need to have pixels which are a bit smaller than this at the start, because you're not resolving the feed legs here. And you need to, I mean, that's where a lot of the... I think the feed legs you can see, like, there. And you like see here. the amplitude. Yeah. And, like, here you can also see it, like, there. Well, how big, how thick are the feed legs? Uh, I don't know. Does anybody know? What this <laughs> It'll appear at least a wavelength, even if it doesn't. But, uh, this on this uh, with this projector, it's in the corner that this is supposed to be a square. So you can see how it distorts it. Yeah. So and on this side, it's actually a square on this side. So something funny with the projector. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. All right. Anything else? Thanks, speaker.